This is the Identity at the Center podcast. This is the show that talks about identity and access management and making sure you know who has access to what. Let's get started. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? Uh, Not so bad. Yourself? Good, man. It's uh, sweatshirt weather, which presents a challenge for me because now I have a a 16-year-old in the house. He's getting bigger and stealing my clothes. And so when I went through my uh, my stock of shirts and, and long pants, I realized there were many missing. So we had a little talk and I got some of them back and yeah, I'm enjoying the crisp weather. Did they smell okay? Or at least how did they smell when you got them back? <laughs> yeah, they were, they were fine. They were fine. Um, <laughs> and you know, I'm really excited about our guest today. He's, uh, somebody I had a chance to work with at Identropy few years back. He's actually one of the people I really look forward to working with. He's just somebody that I had a lot of respect for and a lot of, uh, you know, just excitement to uh, work with. He's kind of a thought leader in our space. So um, I think our listeners are in for a real treat today. Yeah. And the biz, I think we call this a, a good get, right? As professional podcasters that, that we are. Um, why don't we go ahead and introduce him? Uh, his name is Nishant Kashik. He is a CTO at Unikin. He's a former Identropy alumnus and all-around identity maven. (laughs) Welcome to the show, Nishant. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the kind words. Thanks for taking the time uh, to sit with us here virtually. Um, You know, I was trying to think about what our conversation today was going to be about, and we usually try to have kind of like a theme, and I'm looking over kind of like the notes and kind of things that we were thinking about, and it's really Today's theme is we don't really have a theme, (laughs) other than it's just a bunch of IEM related topics, Um, you know, and questions for you and and maybe towards the end, get to some predictions since we're getting towards the end of the year. And that's kind of the hot thing, right? Do predictions for the next year. Uh, Hopefully it will be better for all, Um, but maybe we can get to that. But before we get to that, why don't we start with you and your background? I'm curious as to how did you get into IEM? Is it something that you chose or did it choose you? Um, I think it would be fair to say that I fell into it, right? So whether it chose me or not, I don't know. It may be regretting those choices now, but uh, uh, I definitely didn't set out to be in IAM. I it was basically, this goes all the way back to um, 2000. And uh, I was uh, at a startup that was about to go uh, kablooey. So I was in the market looking for a job and uh, found a senior developer posting for a startup in downtown Manhattan that I applied to, went and did the interview, and they had an office in um, the World Trade Center on the 87th floor. And my reason for joining, besides the cool cat who interviewed me, uh, who was British and um, uh, a good friend of mine, John Eisen, Besides that was the fact that on the 87th floor, it was a really cool view. And I was like, hey, it'll be fun to work here. So that's basically what led me to join them. And we were working on Active Directory and managing Active Directory accounts. And, you know, like I said, didn't really know it was IAM in any way, shape or form for a long time as we just started going through the journey of working on the product and just continued through that. And I think organically grew into what ended up be, has has ended up being a long career in the identity industry. Hey, uh, Nishant, could you maybe give us kind of uh, some of the? Uh, I, I'm real excited because I I think I know your your background right, but I think for our listeners, maybe some of the companies you worked at along the way, including Identropy, which is probably the greatest one, uh, say for Unikin, okay. But um, why don't you give us a little bit of a background on some of the co- the companies you worked for, and maybe some of the things you did at those places. Sure. So um, when I joined Thor Technologies, which is the company I was referring to just now, um, we were basically building a tool uh, that started out with Active Directory, but essentially became one of the uh, main provisioning products in the industry. Uh, For a long time, we were competing against a company you may have heard of called Waveset. And we had a really strong rivalry Uh, against them. And so that was a good uh, five years of my life, built some really solid knowledge there, rising up through, like I said, starting out as a senior developer, but then transitioning to becoming 
a product architect as I led the building of the product from purely provisioning to getting into things like access governance at you know the start of what became is now known as identity governance and building some of the uh, recertification features and things like that. Uh, and that led us to achieving some pretty good market traction, got, did some good work with large financial institutions that basically ended up with us getting acquired by Oracle in 2005. And so I then spent the next, I want to say, seven years of my life really getting into identity management across all its dimensions, uh, looking at the whole portfolio of all the products that Oracle had and then some uh, because of the acquired son, of course, uh, towards the end of my tenure there, we actually had two of every product. And uh, that was a big part of what I was working on um, is how to reconcile the portfolio. But, uh, you know, towards my, the end of my tenure there, uh, that was when there was a lot of interest in the shift towards SaaS and what SaaS meant for identity, both from uh, the perspective of how identity fits into the SaaS enterprise model, as well as what it meant for us in terms of delivering identity as SaaS. And I'd worked a little bit on trying to come up with a strategy for what that meant for Oracle, which wasn't really going anywhere. Uh, and that's when I was approached by our old colleagues, Frank and uh, Ranjit, to join this little firm called Identrobe that had this idea of, hey, there's, we have all these really good practices that we've deployed over and over again in solving the identity management problem. What if we took those best practices and encapsulated that into a SaaS product? And so that led me to joining Identrobe and trying to build our little IDAS solution that uh, you know we had a good ride it was we were i think we were on our way to building something really interesting and really good um but uh, you know it wasn't to be because we actually got snatched up by ca technologies and the product became the basis for what would be their second in, in, in you know second version of an idas product that they tried to bring to market um so that led me to say CA technology, but my tenure there wasn't nearly as long as it was at Oracle. I lasted there a year before I jumped out to um, spend a little bit of time working um, on on in a consulting on a consulting basis while I tried to figure out what I wanted to do next. And then uh, that's when I joined Unic and where I am uh, CTO right now, running our strategy, vision, and product uh, direction. Uh, Nishan, it's got to be a bit of validation for you that. I mean, I remember so many of the um, the ideas that you had around, well, the product being called Squid Lifecycle when it was with Identrobe that you and the team kind of built from uh, from the ground up, but kind of with the vision of it being a a, a true software as a, a identity as a as a service, you know, uh, software as a service offering uh, an API approach. Um, it's got to be validating to you now that you see that the market really is all about that today, right? Oh, absolutely. I think, you know, I think we had the right idea. We definitely had the right um, uh, approach. Uh, maybe it was just timing or whatever you may want to call it. But, uh, you know, it definitely feels like we were on the right path and, uh uh, the market, as you said, has definitely shifted towards that between the growth of SaaS, between the emergence of really usable, strong standards in the space. It really has helped us go beyond where we were back when we started the project, which was, yeah, SaaS is great for identity if you're thinking about authentication, but going anything beyond that, um, you know, is it really a good idea? And password vaulting was sort of, uh, state of the art and obviously now we are way way beyond that and you know you've got great companies in the space doing really well um, uh, on that front with driven by apis and standards yeah it, it's um i think you brought up timing and i think you know there's always the idea of the first mover advantage being a, a great thing but uh if you're too early um that can also be a disadvantage and also, I think when you're starting something up like that, um, maybe a little bit of luck would help. They always say in baseball, better be lucky than to be good. 
<laughs> right. So <laughs> no doubt um, about that. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. So now, now you're at Unikin. You're the CTO there. Can you tell us a little bit about what Unikin is? What problem Unikin is solving? One of the uh, challenges that I saw in the identity industry through that entire journey that I just outlined was we're really good at understanding technology and how to co- and coming up with technology oriented solutions. But there's this disconnect between the great technology and standards that we come up with. And whether it's actually solving the business problem that customers have, right? The, you know, 20 years later, we're still struggling with some of the basics, right? Organizations are still struggling with the basics. We still have passwords. Provisioning is still a nightmare. Governance is still a huge challenge and integration projects take forever. Um, so that was, a, you know, a big part of my learning over the, over, over the course of the years. And, you know, I started veering towards looking for how can we simplify? How can we make things better? And one of the things that attracted me to Unikin was that rather than being very technology oriented, it was really focused on its mission statement, right? Its mission st- our mission statement is that we make connecting safe, simple, and scalable for digital first businesses. And it's a mission statement built around a purpose and as opposed to a technology. And so that's really what attracted me to join the company. And when I joined the company, we had a really interesting core piece of innovation that the original founders had created, but it was narrow. And what we've, over the last few years, what we've been able to do is really expand and enhance that core to build um, the Rel ID security platform, which is our core product set. It's the, uh, you know, it's a zero trust security platform for the digital first business. And what that means is we really look at uh, how to take businesses that are consumer facing and help them create a secure interaction model that allows them to secure customer journeys and engagements end to end um, on, across their omni-channel engagement um, uh, with customers, right? So every business that is now digital, for, digital, every business is a digital business at this point, right? And you have so many different channels, you know, mobile is the fastest growing one, but web is still obviously the dominant. And you now have new channels, whether you still have the old ones, like the in-person channel, you know, you know, still have branches. Well, not in the age of COVID maybe, but you still have branches and stuff, but you also now have new channels like the call center, you have smart home assistants, et cetera. Uh, as a digital business, you need to make sure all of those channels are available to you know, engage with your customers. And you need them to have consistent security across all of that, whether it's security, authentication, all of those pieces need to be done in the same fashion. And it needs to be done with an idea on user experience. And so that's really what we set out to solve is how can we provide a platform that enables businesses to engage with customers safely and securely across all their channels. And we, you know, that's what we've been working on with that focus on delivering amazing security with a phenomenal customer experience. So with that customer experience, um, I know you also um, are part of several different groups that kind of talk through, um, you know, inclusion and diversity and things like that, especially in the IM space, things like women and identity and better identity coalition. Um, talk to me about both of those organizations. What, what is actually your involvement with each of them? Sure. So um, there's, so it's interesting uh, in terms of how we, because like I said, we're not technologies uh, at, at the center of our mission. Our mission is actually around the customer. It's actually led us to all these different aspects of identity. Identity. One of the reasons why I'm in identity or maybe I've stuck around in identity is because it's such a fascinating space and there's so many different facets or aspects to it, right? So on the technology front, you know, uh, Unikin is a member of FIDO Alliance. So, you know, FIDO Alliance, we all know, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. I'm, I know, I'm sure you've covered that in previous podcasts as well, but there's other aspects to identity that go beyond technology. So one of that, one of those is the fact that identity touches so many aspects of business that it needs to be designed for equity and inclusion. And you can't design for equity and inclusion unless the teams that are building it themselves are designed with equity and inclusion. So you need to have a diverse um, uh, set of uh, individuals that are helping build digital identity solutions for everybody. And 
right, really that's what the mission statement for women in identity is. Um, women in identity basically uh, is focused on multiple initiatives that are sort of targeted at making sure that the digital identity industry, digital identity industry is more diverse, has a more diverse workforce, is able to bring in different people with different viewpoints that can therefore influence the technology we're building to make sure that it caters to those different individuals and diverse groups. So um, it's an it's an you know amazing organization with an amazing leadership team. Uh, they do a lot of really good work, whether it's highlighting people, whether it's highlighting areas of um, identity that we don't necessarily focus on or talk about too much. Uh, they've been very vocal, for example, on the topic of how biometrics it has bias built into it and what we need to do as technology vendors and practitioners to eliminate that bias because it has very real world consequences um, amongst other things, right? So they're really good at highlighting these issues and you know creating the discussion that is needed. So we, I've been a you know member of the uh, group since the very inception when it was uh, being created at uh, I think at the Identiverse conference, uh, the, the founders were sitting and planning out what the organization was going to look like. And uh, at Unican, we sponsored them because we believe in that statement, right? We as at Unican, we are. Uh, actually involved in projects all across the world. Not only do we have implementations going on in the US, but we have it in uh, Central America, in Africa, Southeast Asia, and the issues of equity, inclusion, et cetera, show up in many different fashions in those different regions. So this is a topic that's very important to us, not just for me personally, but also from a corporate perspective, we care about that very much because we see the impact that has on our customers. That's a very important topic, and it sounds like you guys are doing great work there. Um, we added a, a member of our team. Uh, she actually was on the podcast with us last week, Maida Gonzalez, uh, somebody with 15 years of experience in the space. And um, honestly, we you know we would have hired hired her irregardless of uh, you know the inclusion angle because she was the best candidate qualified. But one of the things I think is important is for those kind of entry level positions to try to attract women into the IAM industry. So, you know, I would encourage any of our listeners out there who are, you know, in those positions where they can, you know, bring talent into this industry to give consideration to that. I mean, you know, I got into identity and access management back in 2003, definitely it was a male dominated industry. Probably to some extent that's true today as well, uh, I've definitely seen um, more women um, in the IAM space since then, uh, but I think it's not something that you know we we want to drop the ball on or not put a focus on uh, yet today and into the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and the other thing you uh, the other organization you mentioned was Better Identity Coalition. So uh, as I mentioned. Uh, identity being multifaceted. So Better Identity Coalition looks at identity from the policy and regulations and um, sort of public-private partnership angle. So the Better Identity Coalition is uh, sort of, it's an initiative out of a nonprofit. Uh, and the objective of the membership is to actually influence policymakers it, it, on the Hill. Uh, it's very US-centric, though it does look at things globally, but its focus is on uh, the US market and it's really focused on influencing policy uh, initiatives that are happening because they under we understand that what happens in identity influences um, businesses of all nature, right? Whether it's financial, whether it's healthcare, whether it's government, like in terms of services that citizens need from the government, identity is critical to all of that. And uh, it can't be done without uh, policies being in place that help it. So the Better Identity Coalition is really focused on that, you know, uh, public-private partnership aspect of it, influencing policy. Uh, for example, they've been very uh, influential in one of, in with the uh, engagement that, in, that has led to HR 8215, which is a new bipartisan bill that has been introduced in the House uh, by Representative Bill Foster, 
uh, called the Improving Digital Identity Act of 2020. And it's really focused on addressing shortcomings in America's digital identity fabric and uh, creating better ways for uh, Americans to be able to do business securely online. I know that um, you and I are both members of ID Pro, which is another IAM focused organization. And you mentioned Identiverse. Um, I did, you, you did do a Identiverse talk earlier this year that was around Mission Impossible, which I thought was great, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess, where, how, how do you see organizations like ID Pro fitting into that kind of, um, I guess, the, the world of IAM organizations, right? There's Women in Identity, there's Better, Better Identity Coalition, there's ID Pro. Um, there is, you know, Fido Alliance. It seems like there is some sort of group <laughs> or um, coalition or whatever it may be for very different areas of IEM and um, that there's a lot of opportunity for people to kind of pick and choose maybe even specific or multiple groups that they'd like to contribute to. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, so I've been a member of ID Pro since the beginning as well. Um, didn't really have a choice. I think Ian was on stage staring straight at me saying, you need to sign up. And I was like, okay. Um, so uh, I, I, it goes back to the origin stories, right? Like we, as we, you know, as it sounds like you ask everybody about their origin story and it's kind of the same, right? We all, nobody set out to be an IAM. We all kind of fell into IAM in some way, shape or form or got drawn into IAM from sideways. sideways. And that's because I, in identity is not, something that people set out to be, unlike other pillars like security, like privacy. Uh, identity has lacked that professional aspect to it. And that leads, that is hand in hand tied to how the industry will evolve, right? We, we talk about uh, the lack of talent or the lack of focus. Uh, most of the pe folks in the industry learned about identity by working on a product, by being proficient on a technical product. I, I mentioned mine was, I had to learn how to integrate and manage Active Directory. So it was very focused on Active Directory and Microsoft technologies. Um, and it was just through the building of our product that I started to get exposed to more and more and sort of grew my knowledge over time. And it grew organically, which is great. I mean, it's afforded me a lot of uh, amazing opportunities in my life, but it takes a long time to be, feel like you know what you're doing and you know what you're talking about and actually then start making a difference. And given how important identity is, we just can't afford that kind of lag in development of talent. And that's what ID Pro is trying to uh, address, right? So um, like I said, you know, it's, it's identity at the center as your podcast is called, you know, means that it, there's, it has a 360 degree view that you have to care about. So whether it's people, whether it's policy, whether it's technology, all of those aspects need to be addressed. And as you said, there's an organization for each one of those, <laughs> many organizations for each one of those. So it can be a little bit, it can be a little bit daunting. <laughs> and we're, we're going to have Ian on here in an upcoming show, hopefully in the next few weeks. So I don't want to spoil his thunder, but ID Pro recently did a skill survey and uh, you know, one of the questions that gets asked in that is how long did it take before um, you felt proficient in IAM? And I think the most common answer was somewhere between like, I think it was five and 10 or maybe it was 10 and 15 years. But, um, you know, there was, it, the, it, when I say common answer, it really wasn't that much different than other answers too. So I think there's a lot of discrepancy and variation between, well, what is, what is com you know, comfortable mean from an IAM perspective? I feel good on an ops perspective because that's how I grew up. It's funny, I had an opposite experience as Jim. Um, when I joined IAM kind of officially for the first time, I joined a group of ID administrators and I was the only guy on the team. It was all, it was all women on the team. So I, I learned, you know, IAM from, from those folks and kind of grew up on the operation side. So that's where I'm most comfortable. And I would say still am because that's where I've had the most experience in. Um, you know, you start branching out and you realize that IAM has so many other facets to it. Um, that are both technical and non-technical. And it, it can take a quite a while before you get the exposure to all of that, where, you know, now I feel like, okay, yeah, I've got a, I've got a pretty good handle on IAM stuff, but there's always something new to learn, <laughs> right? There's some new technology, some new um, uh, framework or uh, some other thing, right, that kind of comes along. Uh, and that's like, okay, let's think, let's rethink this and think about how this should work going forward. And and you know, put the past behind us and how should it work versus, well, it's just the way we've always done. 
Um, and that's one of the things that I thought was interesting about your Identiverse talk. Um, it was themed around Mission Impossible. And one of the things that I pulled out of it was you had a statement around biometrics as convenience versus security. And I thought that was really interesting. Maybe you can kind of summarize and tease it because I'm going to have a link to that in our show notes here for people to check out. But maybe kind of talk about what you meant by that real briefly. Sure. So uh, the reason, uh, so the Mission Impossible is the theme that allows me to inject some humor and some sort of uh, uh, interest into the talk. But the, the actual objective of my talk was to actually address some of the myths that exist in identity management, some common myths that exist. And it was really born out of my frustration from having been, like I said, in trying to solve problems for businesses, constantly running up against the brick wall of these myths and how they really skew the discussion or prevent organizations from doing the right thing in many cases. And one of the one of those is there's a lot of myths around biometrics, right? And how they fit into the equation. And uh, the common thing that you would hear over and over again is biometrics are not good for security, and they are, but they're a good convenience factor. And it's really rooted in this idea that um, biometrics are being you know being used to make it easy for users to log in. So that they don't have to type in a password on a on, on, in a in a app, or they're not if, having to type the password the passcode into their device, and the biometric is easy. And for sure, it is from a user experience perspective really useful because the data backs that up, right? Before the introduction of things like uh, Touch ID and Android fingerprint, the number of devices on which a passcode was enabled was really low, and it tripled after Touch ID and Android fingerprint were introduced, simply because users were sick and tired of having to type their passcodes in all the time, and it just make, became a super easy experience for them. But that led to this idea that it is about convenience and the security aspects of it are weaker. And what I'm trying to address in the, the talk is, no, you have to understand what the security characteristics of biometrics are, apply them properly, and if you apply them properly, they actually are better for security. And you just have to make sure that it fits into your overall threat models and, and things like that. So um, having that's one of the reasons why, if you look at what FIDO has done in their work, FIDO leverages on-device biometrics significantly as part of its recommendation. It's not required, obviously. Um, you can use a YubiKey and YubiKey, even though YubiKey just came out with the biometric reader on their YubiKey, YubiKey doesn't require a biometric. So it's not like biometrics is a required part of the FIDO protocol, but every in everything you see and hear from the FIDO Alliance, they talk about the significant benefit of using uh, on-device biometrics. And so I think that fighting that misconception is pretty critical as we start looking at how can we make the landscape of security and authentication better, not introduce passwords where passwords have not existed before, get rid of passwords where passwords are an existential threat and issue to the security of services today. Biometrics can be hugely helpful, but it has to be done the right way. And unless you even unless you start looking at the security aspects of it, you're not going to know how to deploy it the right way. So Nishant, uh, on the on the FIDO topic, I did want to point out that we had on um, episode number 56, for anybody who's interested, Andrew Shikiar, who's the executive director for FIDO. So if you want to go back and kind of learn more about FIDO and kind of what they're all about, um, that's a, an excellent way to do it. Uh, I think we'd be remiss, though, in, in while we have you here, to not bring up the topic of the pandemic and how it's changed life for all of us and in some ways created new opportunities. I mean, one of the greatest opportunities for me is a lot less hotel nights this, this year, <laughs> um, but it's also created opportunities for the bad guys, you know, to commit fraud. And I'm wondering, you know, kind of with your work, what are you seeing as some of the, um, the things that have opened up or the fraud that has gotten potentially worse uh, given the, the current situation? Sure. Um, it's uh, pretty obvious, I think, if you were to start looking around, you'll see the data 
that what the sh- what COVID resulted in with the increased work from home environment is sort of an escalation of attacks that already existed, but basically got souped up and went into turbo mode, right? So uh, ev- the shift of uh, employees going from in office to working from home meant that the lax security uh, practices that were in place kind of got exposed. The, the attack surface basically got increased, right? You had way more people that were now available for you to leverage as an attacker as part of your campaign, right? So if you look at, for example, whether it's phishing or vishing, or which, which is voice phishing campaigns, those increased dramatically after the increase in remote remote work. And the reason for that is you now had a large had a larger population of users that you could try to trick into divulging passwords and system access. And phishing is a numbers game, right? It's the more people you can try to attack, there's a certain percentage that are going to fall 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 for it. So the more number of people you have that you can attack, the higher the chances of getting in. And um, the shift to work from home really exposed that. And it really exposed how our sort of security models were not designed for it, right? We had models that were designed for a 30% work from home, workforce working remotely. Uh, but when it went shifted from 30% to 95%, all of a sudden those security models didn't work. You now had um, organizations having to deal with employees that were working from home on their personal computers, on their home unsecured and open Wi-Fi with other devices from in, from their family members on the same Wi-Fi. And so the security model that organizations had completely falls apart and you're exposed. And it just really has resulted in uh, a dramatic increase in uh, phishing attacks, voice phishing attacks. Uh, we saw this. We saw the voice spear phishing campaign that actually resulted in all those high pro, all those high profile Twitter accounts uh, all of a sudden promoting Bitcoin. That was the result of a voice phishing attack on Twitter employees that had that were working from home and had sensitive credential, uh, sensitive access to internal systems. Uh, we've seen the impact on citizen services, right? So for example, we saw with uh, unemployment benefits uh, not being ready for the huge number of claims that were gonna get filed, we've seen a large number of fraud cases uh, against the system. Uh, I think Illinois reported that they had more than 121,000 instances of unemployment fraud because the benefit system wasn't designed to do proper identity proofing uh, and so on. So it, it, it it's exposing the weaknesses in our end-to-end security model, whether it's identity proofing, whether it's strong authentication, whether it's um, channel security. Uh, this, is, this is at the core of uh, what I was talking about in our zero trust model, where we look at not just, um, we're not just looking at strong authentication, but we actually combine strong authentication with things like network security and channel security, uh, device security posture and uh, identity proofing and uh, verification for onboarding. All of those things have to be put together into a single security platform in order for you to get that defense in depth necessary to attack, uh, so protect against this new threat model, a new attack surface environment that organizations are dealing with. So Nishant, one thing that I wanted to just throw out there, like you've been in this industry now I think for like the full cycle of what the industry is really from starting with Thor, going to Oracle, uh, back into the the consulting space, or I think you're more on the product development space, but then going to CA, you've kind of seen the all the different vendors come on to the magic quadrant, if you will, and and some of them move down to less relevance. And and what I'm getting at is, you know. Primarily at, at one point in the game, it was like CA, Oracle, and IBM were the most relevant and kind of the the only options for large enterprises in terms of IEM. Uh, they've lost a lot of relevance these days and, and other um, 
companies have had the opportunity to kind of eat their lunch. Um, I wonder if you agree with that statement and kind of what are the trends that you think led that to happen? I mean, first off, I want to throw out there that I think IAM is just an industry that gives opportunities for startups with great ideas to, you know, blow up and become relevant, maybe not overnight, but definitely within a short period of time. Uh, and it puts some of the larger players at a disadvantage if they're not kind of staying on that cutting edge. And if their their strategy is just to kind of acquire their, their way to relevance, uh, I think they have a harder push. But you know, putting that out there, I, I wonder how much of that it, you agree with and kind of what do you think uh, led to what I'll call, I'll, I'll use the term, the kind of the demise of uh, Oracle and CA as kind of being the most relevant IAM players? Um, I think at its core is what you described that IAM is such a constantly evolving space that unless you're staying on top of it, you're being agile, you're being nimble, and you're in continuously investing and innovating in building your uh, solutions, you are going to fall behind because the solution identity is so critical to organizations uh, today, whether it's uh, from a security perspective, whether it's from a compliance perspective, whether it's from a customer experience perspective, that you just cannot afford to have sub our identity practices and technology in you, in your portfolio. So organizations, uh, so vendors that have not focused on identity and continue to invest in evolving it with the times, you run the risk of uh, you know the technology becoming stale and therefore irrelevant to many organizations. And I think that's one of the things that I think happened with some of the larger organizations is that identity wasn't core to what they wanted to do. They had different centers of gravity that made them make certain choices that in the large scheme of things from an organization's perspective may not have been the wrong thing, but specifically for their identity business in the sense that it wasn't necessarily the right thing to keep them competitive in the market and opened, the, opened, uh, opened an opportunity for other vendors to come in and be more innovative, be more agile, and also take advantage of new frontiers that were opening up that the old technology wasn't ready for, whether it's the emergence of SaaS, whether it's the emergence of uh, API-based uh, methodologies as opposed to UI-based methodologies, whether it's whether it's the um, the uh, the uh, uh, um, arrival of standards that could actually be deployed in a very practical fashion and had gone through the ringer of going from being theoretical an academic to becoming more practical and realistic in actual production deployments. Um, I think I am identity as an industry moves so fast and evolves so much that it requires a lot of care and attention. So unless as a vendor, you're doing that, you're not going to be able to keep up with the evolution. You know, I think one vendor that um, deserves to be, highlighted here is Microsoft, right? Microsoft has been the technology giant since we've been in IT. Um, and they have never really were the uh, much of an IAM vendor, if you will. They always had Active Directory, but they never really got into the, the access management space. And they had some um, offerings, but they were never kind of leaders. Um, but boy, oh boy, I think at this point, they, they put themselves in the pole position where I think what I hear a lot of people say, and I agree with this comment, is if they want to go after your space, watch out. They'll take it over. Um, and I think a couple of things happened, right? I think they made the the shift to the cloud Office 365, which had massive adoption. And then they bundled a lot of their IAM services in with that offering, which really position them well for customer adoption. But also, you know, from a product offering perspective, they made the shift toward open standards. So now you have a cloud-based open standard that you're more or less giving the product to um, your customers who are buying other services and they fit right in with those services, but then also support open standards. So you have the, the wider connectivity. Um, 
I just feel like they probably have done the best job in terms of, you know, going from irrelevance to relevance, especially considering they're a large enterprise IT provider. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's it, it's not just what you mentioned, but it's also the fact that they made the investment. They recognized the importance of identity and they made the investment, both in terms of bringing absolute rock stars to their team, folks like Pam Dingo. Um, if, you, if you care about metrics and what is happening in the real world regarding Microsoft, you need to follow Alex Weinert because he regularly publishes the, the amount of data that Microsoft sees in Azure from an identity perspective is staggering. And so what he can t- teach you about what's happening in the real world with respect to threats, act- events, activities that you need to be aware of is mind boggling. And they're being very open about it. That's the other thing that like they're giving back to the community. So I think the investment in the technology, the investment in standards, the investment in people making identity a focus area as part of Azure Cloud Services it's re- that's it's because they understood the importance of identity and invested in it. That's what's allowed them to be, sort of go from where they were, which is yeah, they're always there. AD was always there, but this has positioned them at the center of you know what's going on with SaaS and identity within SaaS with what they're doing with Azure. Yeah, I think there's been a big change. Uh, you know, when they brought in Saudi and Nadella, you know, to head things up you started to see the shift and it took them a little while to make changes to the organization and and where they wanted to be. And sometimes I think it put organizations at a disadvantage where, you know, from an access, let's let's take access management, for example, Um, you know, Azure AD wasn't all that great for a couple of years because it took them some time to get it up and running and kind of where they wanted it to be. So if you look at you know previous Gartner Magic Quadrants, which are not the end all be all, but you know an industry benchmark of kind of where things are at, you know they were not a leader. Um, and for a couple of years, I think they maybe even dropped off. And then bang, the most recent one, you know, now they're now they're in the top position. You know, part of that probably has to do with their install base and having such a massive footprint as Office 365. But I give them a lot of credit for making the pivot to the cloud and being available and being seen as more than just you know, Windows, right? It's Office 365, it's Azure, it's SaaS services, it's, uh, you know, Macs not being a second class citizen compared to Windows counterpart on services and things like that. So um, is it perfect? No, you know, but I think they've done a really good job of kind of pivoting into being more of a services company. And you're starting to see Apple do that as well, to some extent with their, uh, you know, their iCloud and other other uh, features and functionality. Um, where, yeah. um, you know, that's really where they're kind of pivoting their businesses to be more services and less dependent on, um, you know, some of the legacy stuff like Windows. It'll, it'll still be a big thing always, but, um, you know, having services available, I think is a much, a, a much uh, bigger revenue generator for them uh, over time. Yeah, it's, it, Jim earlier in the discussions mentioned that sometimes you need a little bit of luck. In the case of Microsoft, they didn't need the luck. They were big enough and they had the base. What they needed was to keep the faith, and they kept the faith, right? So it being continuing to recognize the importance of identity and keeping the faith that the plan was going to uh, pan out allowed them to get through that rough patch and come out on the other end stronger, which is something that not all big organizations are able to do. I can tell you that from experience. <laughs> a lot of money solves a lot of problems. <laughs> it gives you a lot of patience sometimes, um, exactly. especially if you know you've got a, a if you've got board or you know, stockholders that are you know. Um, you know, support the movement and understand there'll be some short-term, some pain to get to the end. But yeah, uh, Absolutely. a lot of problems. Nishant, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you've been, you know, really generous with your time. I know we're coming up kind of close to here to uh, when we want to get things wrapped up. But before we do that, uh, you know, it is end of 2020, uh, hopefully. <laughs> and one of the things that I want to touch on are some of the predictions maybe around some of the things for 2021. And I kind of want to go through kind of like a rapid fire list of things and maybe can give me, your quick thoughts on a few different things. How does that sound? Sure. I hate the prediction game. Honestly, it's one of those <laughs> things where I'm like, I hope nobody goes and reads my old blog post because, oh man, I made some really bad <laughs> predictions in the past. So I stopped doing it. Every year, somebody would come to me and say, hey, are you writing a predictions blog post this year? And eventually, somebody's like, no, I'm not doing that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. This is only going to be on the internet forever. So exactly. it's fine. We'll give it a shot. But just imagine exactly. if you get it right, 
right? How much of a, uh, uh, of a prognosticator you'll end up being. The Nostradamus of IAM, I think, is a good title to add. Yeah. All right, let me go through my list here. Um, how will COVID affect the way people authenticate? Are we going to see less physical authentication versus maybe something wireless? You know, trying to avoid touching payment terminals, for example, using more Apple Pay and Google Pay and Samsung Pay, things like that, or other types of biometrics, maybe visual, you know, things like that. How do you see COVID affecting the way people authenticate in 2021? So I think um, what 2021 is going to show, especially in payments, contactless payments, obviously, we, all, we were already down that path, but this is going to turbocharge it for sure. And you're going to see the, the big players really focus on that as well. I think authentication itself, we're going to see authentication continue the path it's on right now, which is, I mean, we are going to have a st- slow but steady march towards password less, uh, which means num- less number of passwords, which is obviously what we all want. Uh, biometrics is going to continue to increase. In fact, I think there's regional aspects to that that are going to play in a lot because different jurisdictions and different geographies have different tolerances for biometrics. So we've already, biometrics is already well accepted in, uh, for example, huge parts of Asia. And I think it's just going to continue to increase. And with with that, there will also be an increased focus on the privacy aspects of that and the implications. So it's going to be a really fun, interesting ride next year, because I think we're going to see a lot of activity on um, physical biometrics but, um, in the sense of things like facial recognition, uh, facial um, authentication, I should say, as opposed to facial recognition, uh, and uh, increased focus on the distinction between facial recognition and facial authentication. Uh, but with masks probably being a continued part of our life, hopefully we'll see you know um, other forms of uh, biometrics come into the picture as well, just because I don't think what people have done with respect to trying to figure out how to do facial recognition while uh, masks are on is <laughs> sustainable. So, you know, let's see how that goes. So I think biometrics will definitely continue to be the case, but it has to be touchless. So I think that means that fingerprint readers at stores, for example, that is not so common for us in the US, for example, but is far more common in other parts of the world. I think fingerprint readers at stores, fronts, banks, et cetera, are going to start to get replaced by um, mobile-based solutions that rely on QR codes or NFC in order to make it contactless, right? So we're going to see some of that happening quite a bit. So if authenticate to your personal device and then somehow the device becomes the, the factor exactly. right, that's authenticated. Exactly. Mobile devices, are good. mobile devices are just going to become central to a lot of our activities because they personally, you don't have to give them up to somebody. So you, it promotes the contact this aspect. And so that leads me to a couple of follow-up I had around. So here's, a, so let me talk, let's talk about iPhone <laughs> real quick. Um, sure. iPhone has gone away from fingerprint and touch ID over the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. They've turned to face ID. Now we're wearing masks and that doesn't work so well. Mm-hmm. Um, the newest iPad though, has a fingerprint or touch ID built into the power button. Here's an off-the-wall question. Do you think the next iPhone is going to have Touch ID in a similar manner? Uh, I would love to say yes. I was actually hoping it would be this year <laughs> where they would have a fingerprint reader within the screen or at least on the back of the phone, which I don't know how that would work with the fact that I cannot survive without a case on my phone. But yes, mm-hmm. I do think fingerprint readers, we will basically, well, I don't know if 2021 is the right time, but definitely by 2022, I do anticipate that iPhones will have both face recognition, as well as fingerprint readers, both in them. Just because, as you said, it's requ- we need it. There is no way to get around that. I, I hope you're right, too. And and for the record, I am a, I am violently opposed to fingerprint readers on the backs of phones because I like to put the <laughs> phone down. And if I have to authenticate and pick up the phone <laughs> to then put my finger on the back, that just that's I just hate that. And I know Google does that. Not a fan of it. Sorry, Google. But at least you have the touch ID or that you have the fingerprint authentication. All right. What about things like WebAuthn and FIDO2? I kind of think that we're going to see a little more adoption there, but what do you see for 2021 now that pretty much all the major players have adopted the WebAuthn standard? So it's, it's fragmented. I think the WebAuthn standard is excellent. Um, one of the big focus areas for us this year at Unican was 
building uh, our FIDO compliance, FIDO compliance into our solution and building in support for WebAuthn in it. But really what will be the impediment for WebAuthn just taking over, because all things being equal, I think WebAuthn would take over easily, is the user experience. I think right now the user experience is still problematic. When you have um, WebAuthn support in mobile browsers on device, mobile devices that have Fido built into it, like on the Android Android devices and on on uh, iPhone iOS, those are fine. Those will work great. But the the user experience for registering a UV key or even your Touch ID on your MacBook Pro on desktop is still very clunky, very problematic, and is a big turnoff for for consumers, right? So. I think that is going to be a significant hindrance into WebAuthn really taking off the way it needs to. I know this is an area that is, there's a significant amount of work happening right now to try and standardize that user experience. Because unless you standardize that user experience, A, you can't work out the kinks and make it better. But B, a non-standard experience is an invitation for attackers to exploit it. And so that's going to be... Um, I think the thing that holds it back in 2021, hopefully by 2022, that hindrance is gone. And in 2022, we're about to really takes off. But given the state where things are today, I don't think we're quite ready for we're about to you know, shoot to the moon right now. Okay. What about sovereign identity and blockchain? We've been hearing about that for, I feel like the last couple of years. They seem to have gone a little bit quiet uh, more Next recently. Question. But where do you see both of those kind of related things, uh, you know, by the end of 2021, let's say. Next question. <laughs> Next question. Okay. How about I, zero I, trust? It is, it, is, it is too problematic. Uh, so zero trust. So, so you heard me use zero trust in our, in our, in, in, when I was describing what we do. Like it's a term that I've quite frankly tried not to use because it A, is so overused now and B, is so fuzzily defined that everybody was able to like, you should have been at RSA conference walking the floor and you would see more than half the companies had zero trust in their, in, in their banners. So I think as a, if we step back from the marketing stuff and actually look at what it is in terms of an architectural methodology, I think zero trust is absolutely something that every organization needs to invest in. Um, you know, it's, it's basically defense in debt. It's about multi-layer defense, defenses that you need to put in place and you can't just focus on one piece. One of the things that in, for all the years that we do, we've been doing authentication and strong authentication, we do not think about the security of it. So we always assume the security. Yeah, we're doing strong authentication and tokens are going flying back and forth and user passwords, uh, username passwords are being sent over the wire. Yeah, this TLS, TLS takes care of the security of it. Oh, I have a token stored on the device. Yeah, that's somehow secure and I don't have to worry about it. Unfortunately, we have to worry about it because as we start moving to device-based security models, as you start moving to places where, to, to scenarios where we now are le increasingly leveraging FIDO, which means you have a private key saved on the device. And yes, it's stored in the secure element on the device, attackers are going to start looking at exploits at the device level to figure out how to attack that, how to steal keys, how to intercept keys, how to leverage. So you're going to see an increase in how malware attacks the security of these, um, these new security methodologies. And so unless you have a zero, zero, you know, a zero trust architecture approach, which is I'm not just going to look at strong authentication, but I'm actually going to look at the entire threat model and look at all of these layers you're going to leave yourself just as vulnerable, even in a you know FIDO security model, to attacks that just like we've had with passwords. Where passwords, passwords are fine if you have a strong password and nobody can guess it, but that doesn't mean that phishing doesn't compromise the strongest password, right? So, I think the uh, uh, I think the understanding of the architectural approach is continuing to grow and increase, and I think it's definitely here to stay and become a core part of how organizations think about uh, their security architectures. All right, my last one is around deep fakes. 
when do you think we'll see deep fakes really presenting authentication and fraud challenges for um, folks in the industry, let's say, kind of, let's leave it a little bit broad. Um, you know, I think right now it's still a little bit difficult to pull off a convincing deep fake, whether it's audio or video, but the tools are mm -hmm. getting better all the time. And yep. how do you see deep fakes affecting authentication and I am in general in 2021? So while deep fakes continue to evolve and get better and better, so does the capability from the biometric vendors, right? So um, it's it's it is to some extent a, a race. It is an it is an arms battle. But what makes biometric and this goes back to what we we're discussing earlier about you know myths about biometrics. What makes biometrics good from a security standpoint is that biometric isn't simply about looking at a face and matching a pattern and identifying uh, who the person is. You also have other aspects to biometrics that make it good from a security technology perspective, specifically things like liveness detection. You have to have liveness detection in order for biometrics to work securely. And liveness detection will, in, from a technology perspective, continue to evolve just like deep fake technologies continue to evolve. And I anticipate that the liveness detection uh, technology will continue to keep pace with how deep fake technology is evolving such that deep fake technology will not necessarily be able to convince a well-defined or well-designed biometric system with proper liveness detection in it to get tricked, right? Now, that goes back to you have to deploy biometrics properly. You if you if you're doing something where you're incorporating biometric technology into your solution, you need to make sure that your biometric technology has good liveness detection. What is its presentation attack detection capability? What is the levels of certification as it has achieved and things like that? So as organizations deploying biometrics, um, and as device vendors like Apple and Google that are incorporating biometrics into the technology. Liveness detection is a critical part that they have to stay on top of and continue to evolve. And I think it will happen. That will continue to evolve because they're all aware of this. And the underlying componentry, whether it's machine learning, whether it's the sensors and the quality of the cameras on the devices. And now with the new iPhone, you have not just you know white light, but you have LiDAR. All of those will start to get incorporated into the biometric technologies that enable you to do better liveness detection such that I think at least for 2020, if you're going back to the predictions model, it'll stay a step ahead of deepfake technology. Can't say anything about deepfake technology continuing to promote disinformation and misinformation across the world, but at least from an authentication system standpoint, I don't think it's a 2020 level threat. I feel like, I agree with everything you just said. I think where I'm most concerned about deepfakes is when it comes to misinformation, which we've we've already seen. but social engineering when it comes to, you know, my favorite thing to do is turn on the potato filter <laughs> on the camera and, you know, be the potato. What, you know, at some point there's going to be a filter that's going to be easy enough to edit where I can appear as anybody I want to appear as, and I can make a zoom call or whoever it may be and fake a bad connection. Right. And tell someone to do something that they probably shouldn't be doing. I, I feel like that's probably the quickest attack route when it comes to deep fakes, but that's just the way that I'm thinking about it right now. I want to use it for the memes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. That, and let's hope it stays there. That's exactly where we want to keep it, bottled up. <laughs> All right. Well, I know we've we've gone pretty long today, but really appreciate the time. Uh, before we get things wrapped up, uh, Nishant, is there anything that you'd like to throw out there as any words of wisdoms or maybe other final predictions for what you think 2021 might might bring upon us? Uh, just as you as anybody's in identity. Like I said, there's so many different aspects to it. Figure out the aspect that will help you and your organization or your project get better, right? If it means you as an individual and as your teams joining ID Pro, absolutely join ID Pro. There's a wealth of information and there's a wealth, there's amazing discussions happening. Uh, join women in identity. Um, even if you're a man, even if you're you know, uh, not in the US, it's a global organization. Diversity doesn't mean women, even until women is in the title, it's about diversity. Join that and learn how to make, create a more diverse team and inclusive team and keep an eye on things that are happening on the regulatory front. There's gonna be a lot of stuff happening on the privacy front um, that's gonna be happening 
from a regulatory perspective, that is going to really significantly impact a lot of the work that we do. And that's getting really ratcheted up. Uh, so that that actually is one of the predictions for 2021. 2021 is we're going to see a whole bunch of privacy regulations come out that are going to significantly impact the work that we're doing. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. You bring up the global the globality, if that's a word, of of identity <laughs> and access management, and you know the different organizations. Um, you know, this show, for example, is has a pretty good following internationally. Um, we've seen a lot of growth actually in in the London area, which is fantastic. And I'm a little bit disappointed because I was supposed to be in London earlier this year uh, to watch the Cubs and Cardinals, and obviously that didn't happen. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to my trip uh, there next time, but. All these organizations, you know, are at least the ones that I'm aware of. Things like ID Pro would love to have more international representation, and you know, it's a good time to join um, any of these organizations that you think that might be helpful, uh, either for yourself, uh, your career, or you know, just you're you're interested in. Um, Jim, any uh, last uh, thoughts from yourself? Yeah, um, I'd encourage everybody to get out there and and watch um, Nishant's Identiverse talk. He's a fantastic presenter. I think, uh, you know, just learning to present, he does it in such a cool style. Um, so see what you can take away from that, maybe incorporate some of that into your own talks. Um, I think, you know, presenting is such an important part of kind of growing your career, whether you're in identity management or anything else. Uh, and then the other thing is just building your network. Uh, so I know Jeff and I are heavy users of LinkedIn. Please feel free to uh, send us a connection, get linked in with us. Nishan, how can folks follow you or, or uh, connect with you uh, from a social perspective? Uh, my most active social media presence is Twitter. I, you know, Twitter isn't what it used to be, but I still leverage it quite a bit. And there's still a lot of us identity folks who are there having really fun, interesting conversations. Uh, if you join ID Pro, then the ID Pro Slack channel is a fun place to talk as well. Um, there's plenty of memes there as well. So it's a fun place to have really interesting discussion on identity. But yeah, Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, you know, and as well, but not as active there. But uh, yeah, that's it. That's about it. And I'll have links to, um, to you on LinkedIn. I'll, I'll put your Twitter handle as well in the show notes, your, your Identiverse chat. We're, we're going to have a whole bunch of links <laughs> in, in the show notes for this one. So Right. And there's a whole bunch of stuff on my on my website as well, nishankashi.com. Um, and you go to my blog, uh, my talkingidentity.com blog. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff there. All my previous talks are there as well. There's going to be a lot of, lot of follow-up things for people to check out. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think that's a pretty good spot to leave it for uh, for this episode. Um, appreciate everyone uh, listening to us. You can always visit our show at identityatthecenter.com. You can follow us on Twitter at IDAC Podcast. Uh, like I mentioned, we'll have links to a whole bunch of stuff for this in the show notes. So feel free to check those out. Uh, and wherever you're reading or listening to the podcast here, uh, you'll find them there. And with that, we'll go ahead and close it out for this week. Thanks for listening. And we'll talk with you all in the next one. You've been listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. If you like what you heard, don't forget to subscribe and visit us on the web at identityatthecenter.com.